Welcome everybody to the online seminar series, Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. Today we have the pleasure of having uh, Jean-Michel uh, Louves. He's Professor of Mathematics at the Institute of Mathematics of Toulouse. He holds the chair on fair and robust learning at the Artificial and Natural Intelligence Toulouse Institute. He has um, other projects around anomaly detection in machine learning, um, applications of optimal transport in machine learning, and machine learning in human evolution and medicine. He has published in uh, journals such as the Annals of Probability, BMC in Bioinformatics, Journal of Multivariate Analysis, and the Proceedings for the very prestigious uh, conference, the International Conference on Machine Learning. He is associate editor of the European Journal of Statistics and member of the Santil Committee of the CNRS Mathematical Institute. So we are very, very pleased today of having uh, Jean-Michel. The floor is yours. Um, we uh, will uh, have the Q&A session at the end, but if there is a very, very urgent question, um, um, the audience can post it on the chat and I will read it for you so that you don't need to uh, uh, be checking the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dolores. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to to present today. So if there are questions, please uh, interrupt me uh, and tell me because I, uh, I'm making the full share, full screen share and unfortunately I do not see any more uh, the chat. So it's completely blank for me. So um, today I'm going to, to present some uh, recent work dealing with uh, fairness or bias in artelligence uh, in, uh, in artificial intelligence and especially in in machine learning so uh, first i just want to define what is bias so it's very complicated so if you look uh, in the dictionary you, you see that what is meant by bias it's that it's about some uh, irrelevant information that influence a decision but should not. So it's closely related to the notion of unfairness or confounding effect and we're going to see that uh, how does it notion interacts with uh, machine learning. So I'm going quickly to, to recall the, the principles of machine learning that uh, are uh, at a state when you study bias. So it has everything to do in machine learning how, how a machine sees the world. Indeed, I'm going to uh, put myself in the framework of supervised learning where you look at a variable which is called x. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you see when I move, move my pointer I, I, I'm afraid you're not okay. So I, I think you don't see when I move the, the, the pointer. Do you? So you are sharing your uh, screen? Uh, yes. Or I, I'm sharing your, your, your. Okay. Your... okay. So, no. so I'm going to okay. I'm going to, to do otherwise. So um, so the um, when in, in a supervised setting when you monitor a variable x which could be uh, multidimensional and you want to be able to build a model that we're going to forecast a new variable y so in fact when you give a machine the power to build a model the machine is only looking at the way the data were generated and see, in fact they look at the unknown distribution p of the couples of variables, the target and the variables, y, i, x, i. And in fact, they do not know the, this distribution, but they just have access to the observation which follow the empirical distribution that is uh, called PN. So the aim of machine learning is to be able to design a model, I mean a function f 
that will be taken into a collection of models that we call capital F that minimize a criterion in mean. And what is the criterion? The criterion is just a way to measure how close a forecast Y hat is to from uh, the observation L. So you define L, the loss, which is zero if uh, Y is equal to Y height in the sense given by, by L. So if you knew the way the data were generated, you will call, you will uh, build what is called the oracle, that means the F function F star, which minimizes the loss for all the possible way of generating the data. In fact, you don't see that, but you have only access to the empirical uh, distribution. So you build the uh, model, the algorithm by machine learning, by just minimizing over the set of all model, the function that minimizes the loss function. And sometimes to uh, prevent overfitting, you don't want only to minimize the loss, but you maybe want to add a penalty controlled by a parameter, lambda, that is a way to measure a trade-off between the complexity of the model or the smoothness of the function and the closeness to the observation. So you have uh, built uh, this model and you are very confident uh, that you can use your new model to forecast new observation. And you're very confident why? Because in fact, you have lots of theoretical results that show that the best way you could do in the sense that you can control the generalization error, you control what is called the excess risk, which is the difference between the loss of your model that you learned f hat and the, the best way you had to uh, construct a model that is the oracle. So uh, the excess risk, this is the, the, the difference between the two errors, is you can prove that for well-chosen model or well-chosen penalty, that this is small. But so in fact, it's working very well. And now machine learning models are very popular and you can uh, use them, uh, you can find them uh, used a uh, lot of time in, in uh, the everyday life. But uh, so what could possibly go wrong because uh, maths are objective, you minimize the criterion, so everything uh, should be all right. Uh, in fact, uh, since uh, science fiction uh, movies or books knew that artificial intelligence or this kind of model could not be trusted and they had this intuition and you can just check, for instance, that there are some decisions taken by the machine despite all the technological and mathematical uh, correctness that do not give you the result you are waiting for. So for instance, if you look at uh, natural language processing, you uh, can make the, the experiment by uh, clicking on the, on the, um, on the link. Uh, it's, you, can, you can do it by yourself. You take a sentence and the, the, tense, the sentence is a doctor run to the emergency room to see and here you put a mask that means you hide the right word and you use a machine learning model to forecast the, what should be the pronoun and you see that the machine at 38 percent is uh, predicting that the correct pronoun should be is at 36.9 it should be the and you see only a 6% it should be. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that you have built a model which is uh, sexist in the sense that the machine has learned that the doctor could be uh, a man, but it's very unlikely that the doctor is a woman since in English pronoun uh, have gender and a patient would mean that the doctor was uh, a female. So it means that you have gender bias. It means that when you forecast, you use a variable here, uh, the gender, which we call the sensitive variable, to make a forecast. Sometimes 
And this is uh, a common type uh, of bias that you have in, in machine learning. Sometimes you have a different type of bias. I mean that sometimes the bias is not only in the forecast, but the bias makes that the algorithm does not work in the same way for different subgroup of population. So here I take uh, an example of image analysis used by uh, Amazon. And you see that the algorithm works very well for a Caucasian male. If you were uh, non-Caucasian, but still male, then you degrade it by 1.3%, uh, which is quite small, uh, the accuracy of the algorithm. But if you are a female, then you lose almost 7%, which is huge if you look at the, the, the level of uh, accuracy of uh, this type of uh, algorithm. And it's even worse if you are in the two minority class. That means if you are an uh, Afro-American female, then you see the algorithm is not working anymore because uh, the accuracy falls to 68%. This is a kind of bias, which is in sociology called interse intersectional effect. That means that when you are, you, the, the bias is not the simple addi addition of bias, but uh, uh, joint bias is worse than the sum of all bias. So how is this thing possible? It's possible because when you do machine learning, you optimize your criterion, just minimize your loss function uh, of, uh, of a collection of model. But what do you do? You, we all want to do that because what we want, and we want to, we hope that the, the algorithm we find will be a good model, a good model in the sense that it could be relevant as a good way to understand the information conveyed by the observation. So you're going to minimize and you find something which is sound and which, uh, has, uh, which is relevant what you're looking at. And that's why you're very confident to, to use this. But maybe you're not doing that at all, but you're just trying in a huge data set, you're just looking at correlation between the data, X, and a variable. So you look when you minimize, you just focus and just use correlation. And sometimes correlation are bad. And here you see that you have correlation with respect to gender, but then you transform a correlation into a causal decision. And sometimes the situation could be even worse. You, maybe you just learn that a new variable, a new individual, is very similar to an individual, an individual you add in the database and you're going to forecast as if this individual was the previous one in the database. So everyone knows that correlation bias are everywhere in the world that's at, that's at, at the basis of a machine learning algorithm. But when you try to transform uh, the observation into a model, then you may amplify bias because in fact you want the model to be used in our world by looking only at the image of the world through the data. So when you do that you have a large uh, chance to amplify some bias and to translate this into what I call the algorithm world. And even if you were very cautious and trying to have a data world very similar to our world, maybe our world is not the world where we want to live. We want to live in a better world. For instance, if I am in France and I want to use a machine learning model to forecast uh, if someone could be higher, for instance, as a data scientist, then I'm pretty sure if I'm not cautious, if I use the data as uh, uh, that are recorded, I'm going to have a gender uh, issue and I will have at the end uh, uh, an algorithm that will amplify the bias already present. So maybe the world you want to create 
should not be driven by our world, but by an ideal world where there will be no bias. So you see, bias and uh, unfairness is a very uh, difficult uh, issue to, um, to, to deal with. So just uh, another uh, example, which is a very famous example based on a, a viable uh, data set, which is the adult uh, data set. It's from the UC database. To just to, to show you how, uh, how this issue of bias works. So, for instance, in this uh, standard uh, data, your aim is to forecast if a loan uh, can be given, so to minimize the risk. Banks want to be able to predict if someone is going as the possibility of having a, what is called a high salary, and high salary is greater than 50 uh, kilo dollars. So for that, you have lots of uh, variables. So you have the age, working place, education number, and uh, lots of uh, variables. And among them, you have uh, the sex variable. So if you look at the data, uh, if you look very quickly, you see that the, the data is not balanced. That means that if you look at the proportion in uh, green of uh, female which have a high salary, it's a lot smaller than the proportion of male with high salary. So you may have the intuition that if you're going to learn the why someone is as a possibility of having a high salary, then it should be uh, susceptible to be uh, biased with respect to this variable. So if uh, I use a machine learning algorithms, so I'm going to use three algorithms, which are uh, one very simple, which is a logistic regression, which is a linear model, everything uh, standard. Another one, I'm going to use uh, a classification tree. And then I'm going to use a black box model, which is a gradient, extreme uh, gradient boosting. So you see that uh, if you look at the uh, accuracy uh, figure, you see that I'm going to predict quite well. I have around 85% uh, of good prediction. But what I can look, I can look at some measure of bias. I can look at what I called DA, which means disparate impact, which is a measure, a standard measure to measure how bias affect in, in decision. And I can measure the uh, proportion of people who have a high salary, that means that have I, Y equal to one among group of women, so among the people who have uh, A equal to zero, so gender is modeled by the variable A, which is zero if it's a female and one if it's a male. And I can look so at the proportion of, of female with a high salary divided by the proportion of male with high salary. So if the variable was not playing any role, this proportion should be equal to one. To one. If this uh, proportion, if the disparate impact is small, then it means that the probability for male of having high salary is a lot greater than the proportion of, of female. So you see that in the data set, the pro the, there is a level of unbalancedness, which is around 0 0.37. And then if I replace y by the proportion predict, that means by y high, predicted by uh, the, log lo the logistic regression, the tree, or the extreme gradient boosting, you see that I do not correct bias, but it's even worse, I amplify the bias. That means that my three algorithm are even more unfair than the unfairness of uh, the usual situation. So you see that it's really an issue that I should correct. I should correct, and uh, there, you know that there are uh, the GDPR and the European uh, Act on Artificial Intelligence. And what do they say? That say that maybe a solution should be not to use a variable. 
So let's do this and let's remove the variable from uh, the database. So I remove the variables and then I run again my algorithm. So I remove and you see that it's completely unchanged. If you know uh, statistics as mathematician, we are not surprised because we already know that it's all has to do with uh, correlation. And in fact, uh, the gender effect is not directly uh, on the variable, but it's due to all the correlation with all other variables. So if you remove only the variable sex and not use it, then you change nothing. So you hide the variable, but you still have something which uh, exhibits a very biased uh, behavior. And it's even worse because if you are, uh, for instance, you're, you're, you, you are a lawyer and you want to test if uh, the algorithm, so what you will do, you will do what is called a testing uh, procedure. So what is a testing procedure? It's something which is, has been used uh, for decades. In front, the first uh, proof of uh, testing to detect discrimination is for 1939. You see, so what you do, you, 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 you create a fake individual which has exactly the same characters, the same characteristic, and then you just swipe uh, swap the uh, artificial, uh, the sensitive variable. So you take the data from the women, and then you just say that this woman, in fact, is a man, and you test uh, the difference. But if I'm uh, a data scientist, maybe I want to build a model that is resilient to this change. So what do I do? I just going to uh, build um, an algorithm uh, to optimize, uh, optimize my, my machine learning uh, setting. And then the algorithm will be the, uh, the decision I take will be the best decision, the most favorable decision, whether it's a man or it's a woman. So that's what I call best, uh, after best uh, SV. So you see, uh, if you look at the right figure, that the accuracy are just uh, a little uh, smaller. That it's very, uh, I just was very little and sometimes almost nothing. But if you look at the way the gen, uh, the bias is changed, you see that uh, the, the bias is not changed. So again. As a statistician uh, or as a mathematician, you you, you knew already uh, the the answer without looking at, at the figure because you already knew that the variable a does not play any role. You can remove it, put it. If you do not change the uh, the variables, then uh, the algorithm is going to know beforehand before looking at the variable a whether it's a man or it's a woman. And there is a no, the, the notion I'm looking at is a notion of group uh, bias. And of course, it's not changed if I just look at, at uh, uh, such, such, such a little change. And of course, due to the new uh, regulation, this is highly uh, punishable uh, by law. So now it's time to define a little more in a more mathematical way what, what is uh, fair in machine learning. So first, uh, sorry to disappoint you, because uh, in fact, there is no consensus for a single definition of fairness. So you, you, we say that uh, an algorithm is uh, unfair if you're able to define a variable which is called a sensitive attribute, and you detect that the outcome of an algorithm is biased, so is change is uh, affected by uh, the variation of this variable why it should not so if it should not for a legal issue in in the european act you have a list of uh, characteristics that should not affect 
uh, a decision in uh, IRIS system or uh, because uh, uh, it's not moral, it's not ethic or because if it's not uh, moral bias, because from a technical uh, point of view, you do not want to use this variable. So again, if I uh, come back at the my uh, two class decision uh, model where y is either zero and one for failure uh, and one for success, my uh, variable a is zero or one, then if I look at what I call the disparate impact, it's a measure of uh, fairness and the closer to one, the more fair it is. That's described what is called the statistical parity, which corresponds to the first, first example uh, I show you. So that means that uh, the variable should not play any role in the, uh, in the decision. And the second case was about performance. So uh, the second type of bias, uh, which corresponds to the second uh, example, deals with what is called equality of performance, where you look at the probability of being mistaken, that means that you forecast y equal to one, why y should be equal to zero, or you forecast y equal to zero while, while uh, y is equal to one, and you look at the difference of the two probability for the two groups, whether a equal to zero or a equal to one. So if y equal to 1 is a success, then you could look at the probability of, uh, um, of forecasting a success while you should forecast a failure or the other one. And sometimes, of course, if you grant a loan, you're not able, for instance, to uh, look uh, at uh, uh, those uh, effects because if you don't uh, if you don't grant a loan, then uh, you're not able to see what would have happened if you had grant a loan, and this uh, should be dealt with uh, what is called counterfactual uh, model. So when you use an algorithm to shape the re the reality, then you are not able. You are just able to control one term of the error and not the other one. So fairness, in fact. Uh, besides uh, this measure, in fact, has everything to do with the notion of uh, independence of distribution. So full fairness, the real fairness, say that uh, you have these two ways of defining the fairness, or the algorithm should not take the variables into account while forecasting. That means it's y should be completely independent from a, or the other one, if you deal with uh, equality of performance, then y hat should be independent with respect to the variable, the sensitive variable, conditionally to what you observe, I mean, conditionality to y. So if uh, y hat is a binary and you prefer a continuous variable, you can replace y height by uh, a score, uh, a probability uh, of success. Or if you're looking at deep neural network, you can look at the at the score at the n minus uh, one layer just before the, doing the ReLU attribution. So the idea now is that you you have clearly this notion of fairness defined as uh, independence in distribution. So you want to achieve fairness. So why not achieve fairness? And a simpler way to achieve fairness should be to project all your classifier into uh, the fair model. So you pick one fair model. So for instance, I'm going to talk about fairness with respect to statistical parity, and I'm looking so at f statistical parity. That means that all the function f x a such that y hat, which is equal to f x a is independent from A. So in this case, rather than minimizing over the set of, fu of function, I want to be able to restrict to the set of function where uh, I have this notion of independence. So this is very abstract formulation. And the idea is first to see if this is feasible and what is the price, I, 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 what is my price 
to achieve this fairness. So the price for fairness should be the accuracy of the model, that means the risk, the minimal risk for over all fair model, minus the uh, risk, the minimal risk I could do for all the best of models. So you all know that, for instance, if I, uh, when I want to uh, minimize, uh, then the uh, best estimator is what uh, is called the uh, the bias estimator, which is the expectant, the projection, in fact, of y given x if I am in a regression setup, or the probability of y equal to one given x if I am in a two-class uh, classification. So what changed here, what changed that normally you have one bias estimator, but here, if I condition my bias uh, estimator with respect to the sensitive variable, then in fact, I have two, two best ways of classifying my data. And I can define eta A of X, the bias estimator for the class A equal to A, so if I'm looking at a binary class, 0 or 1, I have eta 0 and eta 1, and I will call mu 0 and mu 1 the uh, distribution of uh, this bias estimate. So what I want to do, I want to look at the minimum risk. So if I write my minimum risk in the, uh, so I'm going to look at the regression case. Uh, I'm looking at the regression case, and then I can look at the, the error, and if I just condition my error, which is the expectancy of the uh, square of uh, the error, then you see that f if I call gx of a the any, uh, any model, then if new a of g is a distribution with respect to x of uh, my regression function given a equal to a. So, in fact, the idea should be to see if this, uh, maybe, okay. just a question. Do you see my, uh, my slides still? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and now you see the, the pointer. Yeah, we do. Okay, perfect. So if you look at this expression, then you see that, in fact, I'm looking at the expectancy of a variable which has of this distribution new A and a distribution of a variable which is the bias estimate. So this quantity is the expectancy of two, between two distributions, the one given by the bias estimator and the one given by this one. So to go, to go further, I need to introduce a way of measuring the distance between the two probabilities. And that's exactly... Okay. That's exactly what it's achieved, it's achieved by... Uh, optimal transport distance, which is called the Wasserstein distance. So what is the Wasserstein distance? If I take one distribution new and one another distribution new, then the Wasserstein distance between new and new is the minimal coupling between the any distribution which has marginal P and new. So I minimize over all the set of couplings between new and new with marginal mu and new, the distance between one marginal with respect to another one. And in fact, if I look at my quantity here, so this quantity is a coupling between the distribution, the distribution, the variable with distribution new A of G and another one which has distribution mu of a. So this function is a coupling, so it's greater than the minimal way to move mu a of j to mu a. So if you understand 
this thing, then you understand everything in the proof because if I come back here, my I can use a kind of uh, Pythagoras uh, argument, and then I'm going. I can prove that in fact the price for fairness that means the fair risk minus the bias risk is greater than the integral with respect to a of the Wasserstein distance between mu a so mu a again is the conditional distribution of the uh, bias estimator given a and mu a of g is a distribution of the classifier I choose, the, the regression function I choose, given A. So now if I want to enforce fairness, that means if I want to choose G, which is fair, in the sense that new A does not depend on A, then my price for fairness becomes an equality, and here is the excess of risk is just the infimum of all G which have distribution that minimize this criterion. So new J here does not depend on A to enforce statistical parity. So in fact, if I look at that, then you see new A is a distribution of the uh, bias estimator for each subgroup. So if I have if I come back to my gender uh, case where I have two groups, so I have one new zero and one, one new one, then I'm looking at something which is in between, in between with respect to the Wasserstein distance. So I'm trying to minimize the Wasserstein distance between any function new g here, distribution, with respect to mu zero and mu one. And in fact, this formulation corresponds to what is called the Wasserstein barycenter. So I'm trying, when I try to minimize this condition, then if A is discrete, this, uh, so I, I, this expectancy is just this sum. And you see, so I'm looking at a regression function G whose distribution nu is minimizing this quantity and this is exactly the formulation of what is called Wasserstein Barry Center. So Wasserstein Barry Center is uh, something which was uh, uh, invented by uh, Age and Carlier in 2015. They gave a to uh, ensure the existence and uniqueness of uh, this uh, this very center, and now I can uh, provide a feasible way to uh, construct my uh, my best fair regressor. So I just, uh, for sake of clarity, I just take uh, the case where I have a one-dimensional regression. So if I have a one-dimensional regression, what uh, does what change? It change that I can I can write the transport. So if I have t lower s is something that push mu s towards the Barry center, and t upper bound t is something that push the Barry center towards the other one. So the idea is the following: I what do I do? I compute all the bias classifier eta s x and I'm going to combine to use the linear combination of all the barycenter that I push that this one that I push towards the uh, this barycenter just to clarify I just show you the feasible way to construct then uh, if I have two class I compute the bias estimator for the women I com I uh, build the uh, bias estimate for the men, and then I take any uh, function which has, which is here, and this uh, line here, this 
the green are just the barycenter, the Wasserstein barycenter of uh, this distribution. So here we have a feasible way to achieve this cost of fairness, and this cost of fairness is just the the way finally to replace something that should be two models or uh, any model uh, as uh, a as uh, as values by a single model. So you can uh, also understand this as a way to post process. In fact, you have here I put uh, to achieve optimality. I put here the bias estimator. But in fact, if I add any uh, machine learning algorithm, then I could have a model for men, a model for women. And if I look at the optimal transport between the scores and I push them into uh, the barycenter. And this uh, is a way to ensure that my estimator, the, the way I construct is optimal in the sense that it, it matches the, the lower bound uh, of the problem. I presented uh, this work about regression. In fact, it's completely the same in uh, regression. And in this paper, you have the, the exactly generalization of what I presented to uh, classification. Um, the question now is, what do I have achieved? In fact, I have just show you that if I want to be completely fair, then I can do because I can project. But I just show you that it comes at a cost. It's a loss of accuracy. And I have a way to control this loss of accuracy. I can quantify using the Wasserstein distance between the distribution of the uh, the distribution of my the, the fair classifier with respect to the classifier of each distinct module. So I can really quantify this price for fairness. The main question is, is it really what I want? Is it really what I want? Because if I use accuracy to choose the model, then I assume that the way I measure the accuracy of the model is a good way. But if I suspect that my world where I take the data is biased, then accuracy is not biased. For instance, if I minimize accuracy for uh, the existing data, then I will just perpetuate the base, the present in, 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 the, in, the, in the data. And then I will just assume that I want a kind of status quo I mean that I, I accept the bias in the data. And what I want, I just want to control that the algorithm does not make the bias worse, does not amplify the bias. The question is also maybe accuracy is very important for me, and, I, and the price to pay is too much. So in this case, if the price to pay is, is too much, then I want to just mitigate bias and I want to put to remove to replace my uh, condition of independence so I want to weaken the notion of independence and here unfortunately there is no consensus because you can to weaken uh, independence is very clear but to weaken independence is not clear you have to choose a way to measure this independence using a correlation with using uh, any uh, correlation. You can look at the rank. You can look at uh, uh, the famous uh, HSEQ, which is the uh, investment uh, criterion. And then the way to do it here to add a fairness uh, measure to the way you uh, minimize the data. So just I want to show you some uh, example of what you can do in practice using uh, a model which is a regression in econometry. So uh, assume you, uh, you are in the famous uh, example in econometry where you want to select uh, students based on some score. But you measure the score, and the score you, is a way to express the capability, the intelligence of the students, but the score 
is biased because depending, for instance, on the school uh, the, the students wear, then the, the school prepare them. Uh, uh, some school prepare better for the final exam rather than that other school. So you have a regression and you want to decorrelate the, uh, the effect of the school and the way they do in uh, econometric is to use what is called instrumental variables. That means that the expectancy of the noise given x is not equal to zero, but in fact, if you use the instrument, then here you decorrelate. The issue is when you write this expectancy, then the equation becomes, in fact, an inverse problem. So in, instead of looking at why the standard regression model, your model becomes this inverse problem, k phi is equal to r. And k is the integral operator, and r is just the expectancy of the observation given W. So if you want to add fairness constraint, then you want to look at several constraints that can be used on phi in order to remove the effects of some uh, sensitive variable. So to do that, you just, uh, so that's standard results in non-parametric regression. And uh, the way to do that without fairness is just to use Tikhonov uh, regularization method. And then there are lots of uh, results that give you rates of consistency of such uh, algorithms. So if you want to do fairness, then you will say that x is equal to z of s. s is the sensitive variable and you want to remove this S effect. So you want to uh, look at what she, the good forecast, if it was independent from S. So if you, if you look at a linear model, then you can write the statistical parity constraint like that. And in fact, you can see that the constraint is a kind of uh, image by a linear operator of the function. So in fact, the fairness constraint here, the independency, you can write it as the fact that the function belongs to a kernel of some operator. So here in this uh, specific case, you can see fairness as the fact that phi belongs to the null space of a linear operator. So now the, the projection to fairness becomes something that you can write from an uh, analysis point of view. You have phi, and phi you have an image to air by a linear operator. And the, the question is, do you want to solve your functional equation and then project to fairness, or that should be, that's one way to do that. Or the other way around should be, I don't want to solve my, uh, my equation and then project, but I want to solve my equation by constraining my, my function to belongs to the null space. So here you have finally two ways of ensuring fairness, both uh, function are fair, and but the issue is that, that the two are different. So what do you do in practice? In practice, basically, you, you say, OK, I'm going to impose the fact that phi belongs to the canon, so the natu natural way to do that is to add a fairness penalty, and you want that this trade-off to be large enough such that this term is very small. So what you can see, you can see that in fact, if you do like that, you will converge. You will not converge to 
this solution, that means the solution and then where you project, but the solution where you have solved the equation in directly in the kernel of the operator. So you see that if rho goes to infinity, if this is large, then you recover the Tikhonov rate of consistency. So here you have a way to ensure a way to construct uh, the fair uh, regression in this uh, in this context. But what is the price of fairness? And here uh, I don't have the real answer because the only thing I can show you is that in fact the price for fairness should be how my estimator will deviate from the standard estimator. So what I can prove, I can prove that my fair estimator deviates from the unfair solution by these parameters. And you see that this then the bound is in rho divided by alpha square. That means that rho, I just recall, was the parameter I used to ensure fairness. So if in, when I was looking at the consistency towards the fair function, I would want rho to be very large, but the larger I want, then the more I deviate from my original solution, which is quite normal because my original solution is not fair. So if I look at some simulation, I can see that in fact rho can be chosen with respect to the regularity parameter, and then in fact I can find a minimal value such that I, I'm close to the first solution but not deviate too much from my uh, uh, usual solution. So just to conclude, to conclude, uh, I have tried to, to prove you that fairness is important and that if you really want to be fair, then you can do that. You can do that by really removing the, the effect of the variable. I could have shown uh, the statistical parity. Uh, so you can achieve fairness, but then you can quantify what does it mean to uh, the estimation. But what should you do? And that's maybe the the real uh, the real uh, the real question. Do you really want to do maths and just try to minimize uh, a trade-off between the accuracy or the change uh, from the unfair solution and the level of fairness you ensure, or do you want to forget completely about accuracy and pay the price for fairness just to be fair? And in fact, I have no solution to this one. There, there, there could be uh, another solution. Uh, I could, uh, I could, I could uh, have a solution from an economic point of view if I could add the price I get for being fair. And in this case, I could remove my accuracy by a gain for fairness. But in fact, if I just use accuracy, then I. Uh, I, I, I don't know if uh, I want to pay the price for fairness of, uh, of not. And just to conclude, uh, being fair from a matching learning point of view does not mean I'm fair by, uh, by uh, a moral point of view. So uh, I've seen a lot of application which were completely unfair by design. For instance, I've seen an application where people wanted to forecast if children age six were going uh, to be uh, to commit uh, crimes when they're grown up. And even if you put fairness penalty, I'm quite convinced so this, this kind of application is completely unfair by design, even if you try to, to put any fairness penalty you, you, you could design. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop here. And if you're more uh, interested in the in the in the topic, you can look at the the biography. And in bold, you have the the paper uh, 
from which I took uh, the mathematical result I present today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle, for this very interesting presentation on a very uh, timely topic. Um, is there any question from the audience? If so, uh, we will um, unmute you and uh, give you the right to share your, uh, your screen. So we have a question from Emmanuel. Uh, so, Yasone, if you could please give uh, the rights to Emmanuel. Hello, thank you for your very interesting and, uh, as Dolores already said, very timely presentation, very clear for me. So my question is, is more on the technical side regarding the last model you showed us, this regression model or econometric model. Mm -hmm. You basically address the question, what happens if you exchange this, the order of projection, right? somehow you don't, yes. you don't we, so we, and you said it depends on i think there's a well established literature about this topic also regarding convergence results about the and you in in your picture is also uh, very well capturing the the decisive uh, quantities here namely the angle between the two subspaces this angle is responsible for the of, 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 for the speed you could converge in in repeating these iterations because then you can first project on the fairness then go to the closest point there and go back and then and so forth so i wonder yes. how this could be operated in your in your estimates or in your uh, uh, precision here and the next question then of course is we are always looking at criteria in machine learning as you nicely uh, explained actually and you you addressed it shortly so i wonder how would how would i proceed in practice would i really care if i'm far away from the unfair solution criterion bias because even the criteria even the least squares fit or something is not really important in some context and the less the le less importance is the how should i say the configuration of the parameters in the parameter space so probably i don't even care how far i am from the unfair solution with the fair solution can you pl please explain also the role of the yes. criteria as opposed to the role of the distance in the parameter space thank you Okay, thank you for your very interesting question. So, in fact, uh, to solve the problem here, uh, it was it, I just present a, a first paper that we just uh, we just finished with uh, Samuel Santorino uh, and Jean-Pierre Florence, uh, and in fact, to we we used uh, Tikhonov uh, regular, regularization. So uh, that's why you, you can look, I uh, do not write, but uh, every time I, I put the assumption, you see beta smaller than two, uh, which, which has nothing to do with the true regularity, but it's, it's really driven by uh, the choice of a Tikhonov uh, regularization. So, uh, so, the, so in this case, if I, if I um, the, the way we model fairness is through an operator would be anyway, and we, we say, okay, my my fairness is in the null space of this operator, and uh, and then in in the Tikhonov case, then we have this the way we ask, we we write it, and this enforce us as looking at the function which correspond to 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 this. Solution because when rho increase, then the, the 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 rho effect is greater than the regularization. So we first, in fact, in fact, it's, it plays as if we first enforce fairness and then solve the regularization issue. The in 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 the second 
in the second part of work we, we are doing, we just we try to, to, to look at other kinds uh, of uh, regularization. And the one you suggest is exactly the kind of uh, iteration where we, we solve it like uh, it's, a, it's a kind of Land Weber uh, iteration where each time we only we enforce smoothness and we enforce also uh, fairness at the same at the same times. Uh, I, my intuition is that we're going to recover the the first one. Uh, no, no, sorry, the the second one. I, I, my, my intuition is that we're going still to recover this one because, in fact, this in this one we have no control because fairness. Uh, if I if I look at this at the at the equation, when I want to enforce fairness in the solution, then I, I'm quite pleased that uh, in fact the fairness is related to uh, the way k plays uh, uh, acts on the function. So it's fairness. The the fair solution depends on k, and I think it's quite natural and I think that the first way of looking at fairness is not natural at all and rather this one is is sharp so that's but but in fact the the, 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 the thing you say that look at fairness then approximate then come back project and that's that's exactly but another it's another way uh, to do that and that will be in that will enable us to to have better uh, better uh, Hilbert scales than the the one of uh, of Tikhonov. Uh, the second criterion, um, I don't know. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, my, my main my my main issue, and it's not related to this one, is that uh, in in this case, I don't know what is better. If it's better to be close to uh, the first solution and being fair or if it's being fair and being not close to the operator and that's why i wanted to say that to to solve this issue i think i need another criterion and the other criterion should be not a deviation uh, with respect to to the usual solution but i would like here to put another criterion that because here i uh, i just pay the price of being i just change my uh, estimator of being fair but maybe uh, from an economic point of view i should add a price that forces me uh, that enforce fairness that that, that, that that could tell me if i if i'm not fair enough then i pay a price and this for me should be uh, a relevant criterion that means if maybe if i if yeah, if i were looking at something here that tells me you uh, you you cannot, you, you, uh, sorry, you, cannot see, you cannot see the 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 the, 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 uh, the top line this is blocked somehow for me you cannot see uh -huh. the headline sorry okay here you see no it's not full screen mm -hmm. mode so therefore i don't see what you see or what presentation is meant to be Okay. So now, now it's full screen. And now. Now it's full screen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is my hat. Uh, I was thinking of. Thank uh, you. So uh, this I, is now I, a hat constraint. This means that we have a constraint problem. Yes. The convex constraint in addition to the least square procedure. Yes, exactly. And I and and and, and my. So, 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 so the, uh, the, my, my, my main guess, I, I would like to be, to add another constraint that, uh, enforce me to have, uh, uh, a minimal amount of fairness. So I, I here I have, I have something here. Guarantee, I, a guarantee of fairness. You guarantee yes. a certain amount of fairness. In yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and I will, uh, and, and I think a good trade-off would be the, the also to add something the other way around. Let's say uh, I, I pay the, I pay some price for not being fair. Here, here I impose. I, I want to be fair, but I would like another constraint that will tell me if you are not fair, then you you 
you pay you pay some price to just to balance. Otherwise, I I know the lower bound for being fair, and then I say I, I put myself at the border of my convex set, my, my fair set. I, I put myself at the bottom and, and I say, okay, it's enough. Thank you. Another question, maybe? Or comments? Okay, so um, I think there are no more questions. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you, uh, Jean Michel, again for this very um, interesting presentation. And to the audience, uh, thank you very much for the interesting questions. And see you next week with another um, seminar. Yeah, Michelle, um, hope to see you uh, in person.